Ladies and gentlemen, if you had asked me a month ago whether I thought Hasan Minaj was cringe, I would have said, I don't know, probably. My only experience with him was watching his stand-up special, which was okay, if not a little preachy. It was more of that story time style stand-up where you're not sure if you're supposed to laugh or cry. It was critiquing the American government and growing up here and talking about things that happened to him. Unless it wasn't, because a month ago, Claire Malone wrote this article, Hasan Minaj's Emotional Truths, where she absolutely f***ing rips into him. Essentially says that every story he tells is fake, it's all been a ruse, and that while they are not true, in his words, they are emotional truths that allow him to convey different things. Now, I've read this article. It's very long. I do want you to notice, look how long this is. And it's all a way of her saying she thinks that Hassan is f***ing cringe. To get a little faster take, we will just watch this video from The Messenger, which is one of these online news aggregators. For those of you that don't know him, he is a comedian. I watched his stand-up special. He hosted a show called The Patriot Act that was online for two seasons and then got canceled. And most importantly, he is the person who seemed to be in line for The Daily Show after Trevor Noah. In fact, I have heard that deal was essentially inked until that article came out. Allegedly lying about very sensitive topics, like this story about an undercover FBI agent who allegedly infiltrated Minaj's local mosque in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. I was 16 years old. It's 2002. I'll never forget this. I'm in the back of the mosque. The this is a regular story, super right? Super ripped white guy shows up to the mosque. Just it was bald. me. Dude, he looked roided out. He's just like... <sighs> Hi. It's hard to watch like a bit of a stand-up set from the middle without getting like worked up. So you might see this and be like, why are they laughing? What's going on here? But I'll say it's like a, a moderately entertaining story. I'm here to convert to Islam. And my dad's like, Hassan, you see that? It's a miracle. <laughs> I'm like, dad, Eric is a federal agent. <laughs> So that was an example of a story that he would tell that this author, Claire Malone, went through, tried to verify, and could not get the facts on. It said like, hey, this didn't happen. You didn't go out of school on Friday. You didn't actually meet this guy. He wasn't at your mosque and he wasn't a federal agent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the article is just thing after thing that was not a truth from Hassan. But it's comedy. You guys are already understanding like the first issue here is like, yeah, a lot of stand-up comedy is just fake. For example, so many bits start with like, I was at the mall the other day. I went to a game the other day. I was hanging out with my girlfriend last week. And they will proceed to tell a story that is unbelievably fake. Now, the issue for some people with Mr. Minaj is that his stories aren't exactly the same style of comedy and are a little more storytelling to critique modern politics, uh, life in America, things like that. And so if you are made to feel bad and you find out it is untrue, you might think like, well, this sucks. It's just like rage baiting, right? If you made up a story that makes you the hero or makes this other group the villains and it turns out not being true, that could be kind of upsetting to this group of people. With Minaj defending his statements as emotional truths and stating that the punchline is worth the fictionalized premise. Now that is what you guys are essentially talking about. The punchline is worth the fictionalized premise is essentially like the root of a lot of comedy. Most comedians are not having this many crazy experiences in their life, right? Usually they'll see it happen to someone else or they'll just think of it. And so the punchline will be worth the fictionalized premise. Now, I would never lie to you guys for a story though. That's a fact. As a Twitch streamer, we are upheld to a higher standard. Comedians make up stories all the time. That's true. <laughs> now, usually, we do it to make things funnier, not make things more racist or sad. And then it turns out these things didn't actually happen. In a statement on the matter to Variety, Minaj said, all my stand-up stories are based on events that happened to me. Very bold. Very bold. All my stand-up stories are based on events that happened to me, which is essentially just saying this author did not do good enough research. I stand by these things. I am not willing to walk back and even use the defense of it's exaggerated for comedy. It's these are based on events that happened to me. Yes, I was rejected from going to prom because of my race. 
Yes, a letter with powder was sent to my apartment that almost harmed my daughter. Yes, I had an interaction with law enforcement during the war on terror. Base is the key word. That's fine. That's still a lot. That's work. enough. Nanjan's recent work has both served a political purpose and a comedic one, a career that draws inspiration from comedian turned commentator legend Jon Stewart. The GOAT. And also like Stewart, Hassan has been invited to testify before Congress. Here's his testimony. I want to thank Chairwoman Maxine Waters for the opportunity to testify. And I would like to thank ranking member Patrick McHenry for taking the time to Google who I am. Cute. <laughs> what are you doing here? Come on. Cute. So that's the story. This is what happened. And a lot of comedians, streamers, literally everyone on the internet has taken the opportunity to dunk on Hassan this last month until just a few days ago, he put out a video. My response to the New Yorker article, description, I brought receipts, which I think is so fucking sick. Now, I haven't watched this at all. I don't know what he's going to say. Maybe it turns out he doesn't have receipts and he's still cringe, but I needed to take an opportunity to watch this. And I thought we'd watch it together. And I've been asked by a lot of people to Beautiful. give my perspective on what is happening. I've also been asked, wait a second, aren't you a liar? <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know, back in September, the New Yorker ran a piece on me called Hassan Minhaj's Emotional Truths. So I sat down with them to explain my writing process and why I make certain creative choices in my stand-up. Now, when the article came out, it got picked up by almost every single news outlet. Critics are raising questions about Hassan Minhaj and whether he and other uh, comedians should be more truthful with their material. I, just... I feel like no one was talking about other comedians, to be fair. I feel like every comedian linked arm in arm and was like, no, we only lie about goofy stuff. This guy, he's lying about serious stuff. And I feel like he got really excluded from the both comedian group and the political comedian group. I feel like not a lot of people came to his aid besides like his staff writers. Now with everything that's happening in the world, I am aware even talking about this now feels so trivial, but True. being accused of faking racism is not trivial. It is very serious and it demands an explanation. So to everyone who read that article, I want to answer the biggest question that's probably on your mind. Is Hassan Minhaj secretly a psycho? <laughs> Underneath all that palm is Hassan Minhaj, just a con artist who uses fake racism and Islamophobia to advance his career. I'm dead. He's actually just taking it straight up head on, right? To anyone who felt betrayed or hurt by my stand up, I am sorry. I made artistic choices to express myself and drive home larger issues affecting me and my community. And I feel horrible mm -hmm. that I let people down. And the reason I feel horrible is because I'm not a psycho. But this New Yorker article definitely makes me look like one. It was so needlessly misleading. Remember, as we think back about the New Yorker article, and I think everyone here should go and read it, just look at how long this fucker is. It's like, what is going on here? Why does this even deserve an article in the New Yorker? This is just paragraph upon paragraph of how could this person do this, right? So I also respect that it would take a while for him to process like what's going on here. I'm gonna do a deep dive on my own scandal a deep with graphics dive. because there was so much evidence I gave the New Yorker that they ignored that I wanna show you. So buckle up because it's about to get tedious. I love tedious. From that, but first I wanna talk about how and why I was rejected from prom. Now let me first say this. I am 38 years old <gasps> with a wife and two kids. I do not give a shit about prom. Damn, he looks good. 38 years old, wife, two kids? And I have the evidence to prove it. Imagine if he got his prom date and her parents on this. Wait. At the doorstep, her mom tells me they don't want her to go to prom with me because they'll be taking a lot of pictures and they don't want their family back home to see her with a brown boy. Mm -hmm. Bethany's mom did really say that. It was just a few days before prom. Oh. And I created the doorstep scene to drop the audience into the feeling of that moment, which I told the reporter. Is the doorstep moment true? Like, no. <gasps> Is this a real recording? No, no, no. It happened before. Her mom going, hey, sweetie, we like we take photos and we don't want people to see. We have family back home. Did, did she oh, it happened before. I guess you could maybe see this as like it happened before, like before in the special. We were using another emotional truth. Interesting. You sort of give that as the reason of like, my parents aren't comfortable with yes. going to, yeah. Yes, yeah. and yeah. it was, it just yeah. destroyed me. That's understandable. The reporter said, it's understandable 
<laughs> I mean, you know it's understandable. He's doing this for the audience. It's understandable. He put it in his fucking comedy special. It is, of course, understandable. <laughs> That's why it's a good joke. This is what they wrote instead. She told me that she turned down Minhaj, who was then a close friend in person days before the dance. Minhaj acknowledged that this was correct, but he said that the two of them had long carried different understandings of her rejection. What? This whole paragraph makes it sound like I got friend zoned by Bethany and then I turned into an angry incel and then faked racism to get back at her. It clearly does sound like that. This sentence is incredibly misleading and implies the exact opposite of what I meant. Over a decade after prom in August of 2014, Bethany and I met at a restaurant called Sarah Betts in New York and we cleared the air on what her mom said to me at prom. She had an understanding that we were like totally cool. And like, I had been carrying something completely different. Right, the difference between them was how important it was, how big a thing it was, and not that the thing fucking happened, right? When the article says we had different understandings, what I clearly meant was that Bethany never knew how much her family being- Having the recording is actually so sick for this video. This had affected me. That's why we had different understandings. In 2015, I sent Bethany an email congratulating her on her wedding to a man of color, saying, I know I told you about sharing the story about us not being able to go to prom together with kids and communities to talk about forgiveness and perseverance, but this ending, you guys getting married, is proof that love conquers all. It's a testament to the way the world truly can be. Wishing you guys the absolute best, and here's to a life filled with gorgeous Zayn Malik mixed race babies. <laughs> yep, I'm aware. <laughs> Bethany then replied saying, I do think love conquers all. And while it might always be challenging, true love is worth the fight. We also had the unique opportunity to showcase both our cultures at the wedding, with a ceremony for each. I think my parents have come a long way too. And what would her parents have to come a long way from? Racism. <laughs> Again, her parents have grown. My parents have grown. That's the point of the whole show. And that should be celebrated. Love conquers all. But... <gasps> I do not appreciate the New Yorker implying that I made up racism. They misled readers by excluding all of that and splicing two different quotes together to leave you thinking that I made up a racist incident. It would be so sick. I, okay, let me rephrase this, because it'd be terrible to have a New Yorker article written about you saying that you're a hack and you're a liar and you're race baiting, but it would be so fucking sick to have the receipts, right? Can you imagine seeing that, processing it, and then having like a sense of righteous fury of like, no, we're gonna go get this fucker because we recorded the interview and I had my publicist and I've saved all these emails and I am confident in the things that I did. The article also implies that I humiliated Bethany and got her doxxed with my carelessness. So I wanna show you evidence that shows that that isn't true. Here's her real name right now. <laughs> the woman said that Minhaj had invited her and her husband to an off-Broadway performance. She'd initially interpreted the invitation as an attempt to rekindle an old friendship, but she now believes the move what? was meant to humiliate her. I promise it was never my intention to humiliate Bethany at the show, but this reporting is false. <gasps> I looked back at our emails and I found out that I didn't invite Bethany to that show. Oh. She emailed me out of the blue and told me that she was coming because her friend saw the show and said they loved it. Oh. After the show, Bethany also texted me that it was awesome and we kept in touch for years. I even emailed her to take down a tweet that might reveal her identity. Bethany then responded with a really nice email that ended with her saying, By the way, you gotta delete this tweet, it's so funny. P.S. Thanks for the heads up on the tweet. I deleted the other ones, but this one escaped me. It's shockingly hard to resurface old social media, apparently. Thanks too for always protecting me and my family. I don't think I've ever formally thanked you for that and I do sincerely appreciate it. Even in the Netflix special, I don't use any real photos of Bethany or her family. Those are actors and their faces are blurred. What could Bethany have said that led the author to write that? That they felt, she felt ambushed or made to be the evidence. made fun of. If you're still here, I have two more stories that I want to address. I'm still here. <laughs> now in my second special, The King's Jester, I tell a story about how I met and was harassed by an FBI informant named brother Eric. Talk about how he tried to entrap me at a gym, and when I made fun of him, he slammed me against the hood of a cop car. I did have altercations with undercover law enforcement growing up, and that experience formed the basis of this story. But it mm. didn't go down exactly like this. So I understand why people are upset. 
people face real danger at the hands of the police and false stories can undermine real stories. I am sorry I added to that problem. I think that's actually the nugget at the core of the New Yorker article, by the way, is that false stories can take power away from real stories. And people are using that to get mad, even when that is not the case here, it seems. My intention wasn't to take away from these stories. It was to spotlight them through my special. That's why I used this story to talk about Hamid Hayat. Hamid and I were part of the same NorCal Muslim community. When we, he got entrapped, it rocked our community and he spent 14 years in prison. Ooh. We were the same age, same background, and like him, I also had run-ins with undercover agents. I was even physically harassed by them while playing basketball. Now you're probably wondering, why not just say that? I, the whole, you're probably wondering, why not just say that? Because it's not funny. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, we have to make this funny and poignant. He's doing a stand-up special. Every beat has to do multiple things in a funny and impactful way. With the story, That's what I'm saying. I had to set up three plot points. The moment I realized authority figures hate being made fun of, why I named my show Patriot Act, and spotlight the story of Hamid Hayat. The problem is 99% of people watching Netflix have no idea the FBI spied on Muslims at mosques, or they don't even believe it was real. FBI agents embedding in mosques and entrapping young Muslims through basketball or weightlifting or whatever. It's sad. There's a really, if you want to learn more about this, by the way, there's a fascinating, I think it's This American Life episode about a mosque that is in like Irvine, like Orange County somewhere, where there was also a weightlifter who infiltrated uh, for the FBI and was trying to bait these people into like saying they would be willing to do terrorism. He would just text them and he's like, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't you guys just love to blow some shit up? And they were like, what are you talking about, bro? Hamid Hayat's story is really important to me. And he reached out to me after the article came out and he wanted me to share these texts. He said that he had nothing but love for me and that I hadn't diminished his story. But the reporter was far more concerned about the FBI informant I talked about in the special. In the story about the informant, actually the bulk of the story is about Craig Monty. Like sure. you, and so did sure. you reach out to Craig Monty? No. Do you feel like you owe him anything? I've heard some things and I'd rather not speak on that. So you feel like you don't owe him, you didn't owe him like a heads up? As a Muslim, am I supposed to apologize to an ex-con who tried to entrap Muslims for the FBI? Yeah, maybe if he gave us a heads up, I would owe him a heads up. <laughs> now the last story Good I response. want to talk about. Good response, to be honest. It's like this guy was trying to entrap them. And he's not even trying to entrap him. He's just talking about it. My last special, I talk about how I received a letter in the mail. And when I opened the letter, white powder fell on my daughter. And we had to take her to the hospital only to find out it was not real anthrax. This, as you know, is not how it went down. And let me just say, mm -hmm. I am sorry for embellishing the story. Yeah, the reporter feels like she's already written the article because no matter what he says, she goes, yeah, okay, okay, okay. And then just moves on. But let me make something clear. A letter with white powder was sent to my apartment in February of 2019. I opened it in the kitchen. Powder fell on the table and my daughter was just a few feet away. After 10 seconds of freaking out, I realized it was not anthrax and that someone was fucking with me because people had been fucking with me since January 1st, 2019, after this happened. Well, Netflix under fire today after its decision to pull an episode of a comedy show that was critical of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. When this news broke, my life got very scary. Saudi bots were spamming my socials. A threatening letter was sent to Netflix. I was getting weird phone calls at night. Then fake anthrax was sent to my house. And after that happened, I asked Netflix for our security guard to follow me everywhere. And people noticed. The danger at that time was palpable, but Bina and I decided to keep the anthrax scare private because we were worried that Netflix might shut down my show, mm. which would have put my entire staff out of work. Now you might be wondering, this is all terrifying, so why embellish? Why even say you took your daughter to the hospital? The night of the anthrax scare, Bina and I, we got into a huge argument and she kept asking, Hassan, oh. What if this powder fell on our daughter? So I created the hospital scene to put the audience in that same shock and fear that me and Bina felt playing out that night. And, and it's I, not like the hospital scene is like, it was anthrax and the doctor saved her life. It's like, oh, it wasn't. <laughs> it's the same realization. The ending is the same. Someone mailed them something with the intention of scaring them that happened to not be anthrax. Added the investigator character because women in my life were telling me that Bina was coming off super naggy in old versions of the story. Mm. So I gave some of Bina's lines to other characters so that her perspective was represented in a way that didn't reflect poorly on her. Again, That's very nice. I don't think there's any comedian on earth 
who has stood in front of more data viz than me. But in my work as a storytelling comedian, I assumed that the lines between truth and fiction were allowed to be a bit more blurry. Question from the jerk? chat. So is the story mostly true with just an added layer to increase the tension and or humor? That's what I do all the time in my personal life and I don't even have a Netflix special. Yeah, in fact, I would say that's what most people do all the time. It's not even just people who are trying to be comedians. Most people, a thing will happen and it's not that interesting and they'll spice it up a little bit. And this is not spiced up in a way to make it racist when it wasn't. It was racist and he told it in a way to make it make more sense or be punchier, right? Is this well, Daily Show thing gone for sure? I mean, there's a chance that with the response to this and how many views it's getting, maybe it's back on the table, who knows? Mm -hmm. Even the last line of the article is stripped of the context to leave you with the impression that I'm some sort of unrepentant liar. He told me the emotional truth is first, the factual truth is secondary. Really hard to have them put in the full quote with full context, but they refused. So let me leave you with the full context. Ooh. When people see a Hassan Minha show, mm -hmm. there's two different expectations. Mm -hmm. There's the Hassan Minha you see maybe here at the Comedy Cellar, mm -hmm. where there is an implicit agreement between the audience, like we're going down into a basement, like we're about to see a one-hour comedy show that feels like there is an emotional roller coaster ride. Sure. Then there's Hassan Minhaj, the guy you've seen on The Daily Show as a correspondent or the guy from Patriot Act on Netflix, mm -hmm. which is, I am not the primary character. The news story is the primary character. With the latter, the truth comes first. Comedy sometimes comes second to make the infotainment the sugar on the medicine. Mm -hmm. And this, the emotional truth is first. Damn, that is such a wildly different statement in context. Holy, I was wondering how, what could he have said to make that make more sense? Because it feels a little iffy of like, hey, the emotional truth comes first. But fuck me if he doesn't give like four paragraphs of context. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. In political comedy, facts come first. In comedic storytelling, Emotions come first. That is what I said, and that is what I meant. Will I be more thoughtful about sticking to the facts in my storytelling? Absolutely. I have no problem with honest, good faith critique because I am always trying to improve as a performer and as a person. There is much more important news happening in the world right now that needs your attention. So I appreciate you watching. I take the note, and I hope to see you at the next show. Great video, absolutely great video. Now you might be wondering, well, what did the New Yorker say? How could anyone watch that and not say, you know what, we've pulled the article, we're gonna be doing some additional fact checking and we will put out a response or a correction soon. Instead, this is what they said, <clears throat> our official statement. Hassan Minaj confirms in this video that he selectively presents information and embellishes to make a point exactly what we reported. Our piece, which includes Minaj's perspective at length, was carefully reported and fact-checked. It is based on interviews with more than 20 people, including former Patriot Act and Daily Show staffers, members of Minaj's security team, and people who have been the subject of his stand-up work, including the former FBI informant, Brother Eric, and the woman at the center of his prom, Rejection Story. We stand by our story. This, to me, now I've read their article, I've read his response, and now I've read their response. Seems absolutely fucking insane. And as someone who went into this not really knowing, I had seen one stand-up special from Hassan, and now reading the article, I have been completely converted on he is cringe to he is the most normal human being who is trying to get by as an entertainer in a world where he is both a stand-up and a political commentarian, as a world where so he has been ambushed, his pants have been pulled down in front of the world, and a world where he has maybe missed out on the job of his dreams because of this article. But you know what? Let me know what you think. I don't know. New Yorker cringe? Hassan cringe? I'm a team New Yorker cringe.